four, three, two. All right, we are live. Hello and welcome everyone to another Chat and Learn here with Power to Fly. My name is Mariella Marie, and as always, super excited to roll into this next hour with you all. Um, I had a chance to chat with our guest speaker briefly, so I know she's going to share a lot of knowledge. She's really excited to share what um, uh, our topic is today, which I love. It's about storytelling and just being yourself, your authentic self, um, and, and building bridges in the world by sharing our story. I mean, she's going to drop so much knowledge. I'm, I'm with my pen and paper here ready to take notes. Um, but before we officially begin, I just want to go over some quick housekeeping rules. First, stay hydrated. I need to remind folks, if you got your tea, your water, coffee, uh, this is going to be an hour-long conversation, and we want to make sure that you are sharing your voice. Um, so, you know, close those tabs, you know, stop multitasking, be present with us if you can, so that you can really participate and really maximize this time. Um, so turn your cameras on if you feel called to do so. Um, this is a safe space. I really pride myself in holding safe digital spaces because we know that things can get crazy out there. I'm not afraid to kick people off, uh, but I do want to make sure that folks are able to share their voice. So whenever you've got something you want to share, please use the chat box, um, throw whatever you want in the chat box, any questions, any tips and tricks of your own, any reflections, any dreams you had last night, you were more than welcome to just share your voice there in the chat box, or you can hop off mute. Um, you can just uh, raise your emoji hand, hop off mute whenever you hear there's a, a, a proper time to do that. Um, and uh, I'll be reminding you throughout the session, I'll sound like a broken record to hop off mute. So don't worry, I'll, I'll hold for light pauses even to give that extra space for folks who need that extra um, push to hop off mute and share their voice. So hopefully we can get people to share their voice because we're talking about storytelling today. We really want to, you know, make sure that that we are being inclusive and diverse in the way that we're presenting this. So please feel free to join us. Um, if you do hop off mute, you will be featured in our live recording as this is being recorded. Um, and if you signed up for this chat, you will be getting a rewatch email with a link to this recorded chat where we will include any resources that our guest speaker mentioned. So no need to kind of, you know, open multiple tab tabs and look for things now. You'll get that rewatch email, you'll get links there. Um, and feel free to write to me privately if you wanna be held anonymous. Um, and you know you can find me in the chat box under Mariella Marie and I'm happy to keep you anonymous uh, with your question or your reflection. The last thing that I'll say is we'd love for you to follow us on socials and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can keep up with all the great chats we've got in store. And if this is your first time joining a chat where I'm moderating, I'll just take a couple seconds to introduce myself. So my name is Mariela Marie, officially from California, but I live in um, Argentina and Patagonia. Um, and I love speaking about the importance of emotional intelligence at home, at work, and at play, so in our communities in general. So maybe I might bring some of my um, reflections there. If anyone's interested in philosophizing on emotional intelligence with me, I see that Cynthia just hopped on camera, so maybe you're interested in the topic. <laughs> um, feel free to, to philosophize with me. I think we have a lot of room to grow in that department. So I think, you know, if we can just use any time to be mindful of emotional intelligence, that would be great. Uh, if anyone's interested in supporting the project that I'm working on, you can go to the positiveforceteam.org. You can sign up for our newsletter um, and see what I've got uh, to share with you there or I'm happy to connect on LinkedIn. Also, great. I'm just really happy to pass the mic to our guest speaker who's calling from San Francisco today. Nava, let us know a little bit about yourself, um, how you came to learn about Power to Fly and what you're excited to share with us today. Oh, well, thank you so much, Mariella. And I love the photo you had on your slide. That was so cool. Um, but as she mentioned, my name is Nava Ahmed and I'm based in San Francisco, California. I'm currently working at Prezi as a content editor, but a lot of my experience and background has been in journalism. And I heard about Power to Fly through actually my manager who's done multiple chat and learns with this team and I've worked with them on multiple projects before. So I'm just really excited to be here and excited to have a conversation, talk about storytelling because that's just something I'm very passionate about. So I really appreciate everyone who's already here and I'm just really excited. Awesome, great. Okay, so to set the stage for today's conversation, I would love for you to walk us through the principal themes for today's talk. Um, and then we'll roll into these awesome questions that you all submitted previous to the conversation. So Naba, why don't you set us up here? Awesome, yeah. So today we're on our agenda, we have five different items that we're gonna be covering. The first is the importance of storytelling and then how to build your presentation on a story's foundation or a story's structure. Three essential storytelling elements five common mistakes that we want to avoid, and then lastly, how to actually apply these principles beyond just a presentation like this and use it in daily meetings, sales pitches, product demos, and all things like that. 
Great. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can open up uh, the list of questions that you'll have submitted previous to this conversation. So um, if you hear your question come up, please let us know that you're on the line so that we make sure that we get your question answered. Um, if the question comes to mind, you know, during this uh, next, this next, I guess the hour is going by super quickly already. So in the next, you know, 50 minutes or so, um, write that question in the chat box or hop off mute and ask that question um, if anything comes to mind. So again, you, if you didn't get to submit a question before and something comes to mind, we want to hear from you. Um, all right, so let's start with this first question here. What are some techniques I can use to find my story? Yeah, this is a really great question. And I just want to preface this first off by saying that when you're crafting a story, you want to base your presentation or meeting on, you really don't need it to be like some grand or life altering experience. Instead, what I recommend you do is you pull from past projects or experiences. Um, and like one of my favorite examples is what my manager, Lorraine, has done where she starts off all her presentations with the story about her public speaking experience. So she goes into how like one day she had an interview in the Empire State Building and she was just like a ball of nerves and she kind of walks us through the entire process. And it's just much easier for you personally to share an experience like that, that most people are able to just relate to. So speaking of sharing stories that people can relate to, um, I just want to also extend the invitation to folks who are calling live with us today. Um, we want to hear from you. We want to hear stories um, about how you share your story or maybe anything that you find um, is a point of conflict, because I think that we can find really beautiful ways to um, find resilience um, and just encouragement and, you know, create advocacy behind something uh, when we've discovered that conflict. So don't be afraid to speak about taboos during this session. Let's demyst demystify the power of storytelling. Uh, and I love that you're also bringing it to, I mean, in this uh, reflection that you just gave um, now, something that we can all kind of empathize with, right, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and so bringing us to that foundation of empathy, which is a part of emotional intelligence that I love to highlight um, so that we can just be better people and build better products and just be, you know, get along uh, better in our communities. Um, so yes, please feel free to, to share more about this. <laughs> and actually on that note, I, I do want to say I have a couple recommendations and these are things that I've learned in my experience and actually in a boot camp did. Um, so one of them that I really like is to just have like a little brainstorming session with yourself where you can write down things that you thought were key moments in your life and then kind of pull away. What did you learn from each of them? And what do you think like actually relates to the message of what you want to be presenting to an audience? And then kind of trickling into that, this is an activity I learned at Shine Bootcamp, with the, which is a speaker accelerator program. And they basically asked us to create a Venn diagram. And on one side, we put all our experience. So, you know, the jobs you've had, what you've done in those roles, the skills you've accomplished as of that, and then your passions on the other side. And then once you have that all filled out, then you can kind of look at the middle and start brainstorming topics based on what you have a lot of experience in and also what you're passionate in. Because it comes across on camera when you're actually speaking about a topic that you're interested in, because it's something that, yeah, maybe you're really, really great at it, but if you don't care as much about it, it's, it's not gonna be as impactful for your audience either. Right. And we talked to with Lorraine with your manager, is it or your coworker? Yes. Um, just, you know, how do you how do you express yourself, you know, in a virtual setting, you know, this this mm -hmm. one dimension um, when we are, you know, three dimensional folks? Um, how do we relay uh, our authenticity and what makes us human in this square? So I love mm -hmm. that you're you're highlighting you're highlighting you know, the importance of finding ways to overcome that, because I mean, especially after this past what, you know, almost two years, we're figuring out how to listen, like practice active listening more and more, hopefully, like hopefully we're not right. multitasking all the time, but we're, we're figuring out how to practice active listening more. We're figuring out that we are more alike than we are different because we can share this virtual space. So I feel like story, storytelling has been a little amplified um, now that, you know, this digital revolution is happening. Okay, let's let's move on to this next question here. We've got lots more to talk about. Is it wiser to start one story with the results and then tell the situation, obstacles and action? What are the elements of a good story? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So there, there's a lot in these questions. So I'm going to start just with the first one. Is it wiser to start one story? So I think that you could do it either way. You can start from the very beginning and kind of go through all the obstacles, all the challenges that it took to get to the end result, or you can even just tell the result off the bat 
And because both are common stories, story structures where, you know, you kind of reveal the ending and then backtrack a little bit, or you just walk them through the whole thing, your audience is going to feel like a sense of familiarity as you're telling your story. And that's going to be, that's going to make them just more inclined to like, to listen and pay attention. And I actually have an example here from one of the TED Talks. So I'm just going to pull it up. So are you all seeing on my slide right now? I have. Okay, yeah. great. So this is an example of um, Amy Purdy, who did a TED Talk all about her experience getting bacterial meningitis, which led to her losing both her legs, but then she relearned how to snowboard to continue her professional career. And so what I typically like to use for all my stories is the hero story structure. But again, that's not to mean you can't start off with the results first. But I kind of wanted to walk through this and just like show you how she played it out and how you could also do it in presentation or a meeting. So from here, um, if we if we start off and just compare it to her TED talk, we can see how each of the stages work. So if we're starting off with the intro, this is typically where we include all the background information and introduce our hero or just like the key message for whatever you're doing. And so in Amy's TED Talk, she applied all of this by providing us with information on our childhood. She shares that she grew up in a desert town and that while she was growing up, she always wished to live in a place where it snowed. And then at age 19, she finally was able to. The story progresses as we then move into the rising action stage. And so the structure here tells us that the rising action is what's used to highlight the main problem that the hero is going to face and ultimately have to overcome. And in this case for Amy, this is when she found out that she got the flu was in the hospital on life support, and that is when she unfortunately lost both of her legs. At this point now, you know, you're kind of unsure of Amy's fate, which is continuing to reel you in. And we know from the start, because Amy did preface it, that she's now a snowboarder again, but we know it's all going to end well, but we're still intrigued to know how did she get to that point. So now that we're here, Amy decides that she's gonna get back on her snowboard, but she's still having some difficulties, especially when it comes to the type of prosthetic life she wants. So we still see her in a state where she's trying to overcome something. As we move into falling action, we begin to see progress on the hero's problem, but it's still not fully resolved. And so for Amy, she's still trying to choose her prosthetic leg. And so what she ends up doing is just saying, you know what, I'm going to do it myself. And she, instead of trying to make a leg match her, she just ends up creating legs for herself. So with that, she's able to go back to school and start snowboarding again. And then finally, we move into the resolution. So as the name implies, we're at the point where we're trying to wrap up the story and show how she has overcome the problem that she was initially presented with. And now Amy has begun snowboarding again with her newly designed legs, and she's won two back-to-back -back World Cup gold medals and also started a nonprofit for young adults with physical disabilities. So your story doesn't need to end with you winning a gold medal, but we saw that with the hero story structure, she kind of prefaced it by giving us the results. We knew that she was going to be a gold medalist. She's achieved so many things, but we still went through all the obstacles and we're still inclined to listen to her. So to answer your question, Either way can work, and I think you can spin it. <laughs> Great. Wow, that's a, such an inspiring template um, on how to be super effective in your storytelling. And of course, her personal journey just adds a lot of um, nutritional value to the story because she's being authentic. She's sharing this part of herself that she doesn't necessarily need to, uh, but she wants to. Um, and I think that we can find some inspiration in that just as all of the isms come up in life, right? With sexism and classism and racism and all the things that we are confronted with, with something as simple as, you know, a job search, you know, it's like, okay, how do I present myself? How do I tell, you know, tell this interview um, or tell the, the, the hiring manager, like, the best about myself and also the things that I'm working with to and become also a better be like person. as authentic as you can as authentic right right I'm wondering I don't think that this question was submitted but just because I'm curious um as I know a lot of folks are job searching and just trying to uh show and demonstrate let's say emotional intelligence because I hear during these virtual career fairs you know people are like make sure you ha you highlight your soft skills and there's this big debate about whether emotional right. intelligence would be labeled a soft skill or, or a technical skill so they're like, okay, you know, how can you share um, something about yourself, essentially a story in an interview mm -hmm. to where you can, um, you know, demonstrate that you are practicing empathy, you're practicing self-awareness and all these things that will make you a better product manager or a better, you know, developer. Do you have any quick tips on how to like kind of bring this format into uh, a short interviewing session? 
Yeah. Yeah. And I'm really glad you brought up this question. And I think, you know, you don't apply it exactly as the structure is, but I think if you're able to maybe pick a project or, you know, an assignment that you worked on with a group, a group, or just like on your team, or even by yourself that had other stakeholders, I think if you're able to kind of like walk through the entire project, start off with, you know, who was involved, um, like what was the end result and kind of just lay out everything before you start crafting your story and say like, okay, this is the goal and this is what I achieved. If you are able to walk through that whole process and then also talk about, you know, if there were stakeholders involved, like how you worked with them, how you collaborated with them, that does show off, you know, your soft skills and how you work with team members, how you are able to even like delegate if you needed to. So I think as long as you are able to like lay out your entire project and just showcase like, okay, this is what I was able to achieve, but also take into consideration everything else that was involved. Like if there were other people involved, like make sure even though it's an interview, credit is given where credit is due because, you know, you want to show that you are a team player and like you're trying to, you want to get this job, but you also just want to show off like the type of person you are and you shouldn't have to sacrifice that just to get a job. Yes, I love that. Preach that. Okay, so I'm going to just hold for a light pause to see if someone wants to hop off mute um, and ask a question or voice a reflection. Um, you can use this time now to hop off mute. Feel free to do so. If not, we've got more questions to roll into. All right, I'm going to be doing that a little later. So just in case anyone wants to prepare for that next one. All right, uh, so I'll, let's move I'll on. I'll jump to this. in if that's oh, okay. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Hi, I'm Tisa. Sorry, I'm not on video, but I'm here. Um, quick question. Um, I, I really appreciate the, the framework of the, the hero's story. And I'm wondering how much of that is just sort of our general way that we storytell just as sort of human beings, person to person, and how much of it is really sort of like a purposeful crafted sort of thing? Yeah, great question. You know, I think if, if we take it back to like high school or college, this structure is very familiar of like an essay, you know, you still have like your intro, your body paragraphs, and then your conclusion. So it definitely does touch on what we're familiar with and just like general writing structure. But I do think there is ways to incorporate being like very purposeful and impactful in your delivery. And so I feel like, yes, you have this framework and you use it in order to write up your presentation, write up the story you're trying to tell. But then once you have the like core structure of your story, then you're able to add elements to it to have more purpose. And so just like in your delivery, in the visuals you incorporate, and, you know, even just like how you set the scene. You could, you could start off by just saying like, okay, there, there was a girl who walked into an interview and she was scared, but Lorraine did something different where she started off by saying like, okay, I got on this flight. I was really nervous. And like, all I was thinking, like she, she took us through the whole journey. So I think you start off with the structure, like very basic, you add in your story again, just kind of like the facts. And then you go in and you add a little bit more, you add some more descriptors just ways that you know your audience will will feel and like understand what the characters are going through as you tell your story. And I, I know I'm saying characters and this is all in like a hero journey, but you know, if this is like a project you're talking about, you're you're essentially the character, or you know, maybe even your product is the character or the customer you're talking about. So it's kind of just like reframing the structure and using it to how it will work best for you. Awesome. Thank you for hopping off mute. I appreciate you. Um, great question. I think that if I could add to that reflection um, with there, just there's so many opportunities for us to show that we can be the change we want to see. And I think if we just like add that to the way that we share our stories, we can show more possibilities on how to do things differently. So um, I think that with the more um, kind of realistic, you know, close to the touch experience, I think that that will elevate the, the, the excitement a little more. I mean, for example, um, you know, speaking about your community, what, like, I feel like traditionally or historically speaking, we haven't been able to like, let's say, bring that into an interview. People don't want to know about your neighbors. People don't want to know about, you know, what you do on Saturdays, but you can share that if there is some moment of, of resilience, let's say, or something that is uh, impactful with, let's say, 
I was hosting um, an event and this, this gentleman had just come from a protest and like the next day, like he was locked up for protesting for human rights, essentially. Mm -hmm. And he still came to the event the next day. And he was like, you know, I'm, having, I'm going through this like existential crisis, you know, like the world's on fire. It was a poetry workshop. And so actually he was able to add his story that he had just experienced the day before from being locked That's up awesome. from protesting uh, and joining this poetry workshop. Um, and just, he was able to himself discover new things about himself. So I think with stories, it's like, we're, it's, it's a lot about showing who we are, but I think if we can personally be affected or just reminded of how, um, you know, beautiful we are or find the mm -hmm. beauty in our humanity, I think that that will just help us, you know, share that story. So first, I think it can be touching for ourselves and then move to be um, moving for someone else, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you make a really strong point, because I feel like, and going back to what you're talking about, of just like how you portray yourself in an interview, like, they, they, whoever's interviewing you knows who you are based on your resume, like they, they know the the facts they know your experience but this is like an opportunity for you to like humanize yourself and yeah like talk about your experiences and share because what you do do on the weekends is representative of who you are as a person and so these are the people that you want to work with they, they should know that as well and like you know of course some things can be kept private if you'd prefer but they also should know what you're interested in <laughs> of course of course okay so um for the person who just wrote me privately i'm going to bring your question up um with this next question because it, it's i think it can go hand in hand here so just hold for that question. Um, I'm just speaking out loud to the person who privately wrote me. All right, so let's move on. How do you make sure that your story fits your audience? And how do you make sure you have the right story for the situation? Yeah, great question. And so again, I'm going to pull my slides back up just to show um, the three elements that I had discussed a little bit earlier, but I have a slide on the three elements of storytelling. And so for me, those are creativity, authenticity, and relevance, which I like to think of just for easy reference as car. So let's dive into how each of these will be used. So the first one I'd say is creativity, which plays a huge role in your presentation, because what many people forget is like, you, you really don't need to be a master designer in order to be creative. Like it's about going back to what I said, it's more about how you deliver and present your story because that's just more impactful in keeping your audience interested and attentive and engaged with what you're speaking about. So I have an example here from author Tim Urban, who in one of his TED Talks, he, I can kind of see it in the picture, but he used stick figures and a monkey in order to explain the process of procrastination. So with stick figures, you know, you, anyone can kind of do that. So it's, he's showing that like, you really don't need to have all the bells and whistles. It's not about a well-designed presentation. It's really about how your audience is going to be consuming the information and how you're presenting it. So as long as the visuals are there to supplement your story and complement your delivery, that's really all you need. One thing I do want to point out, though, is that while you don't need expert designers, as I've said, visuals still have an impact. So my pro tip is just the easiest way to prevent your audience's eyes from glazing over is to incorporate some sort of visual content. So that can be like stick figures like Tim did, a couple of images like I have here, or, you know, even just some short bullets, just something to like draw your audience's eyes to you and your screen. Moving into the next one, authenticity. I've already touched a little bit on the importance of this because stories really allow space for human connection and emotion, but personal experiences really can help take your storytelling to the next level. And it can also take a lot of courage to share personal stories, but you know, even when it, if an, with an interview and a discussion like this, it will add more credibility for you. So I have an example here from Cheryl Sandberg, who delivered a commencement speech at UC Berkeley in 2016. And at this speech, for the very first time, she shared how she felt on the one-year anniversary of her husband's death. So it was incredibly moving, but she did bring up, build a lot of credibility and trust by confiding in her audience. And in doing that, she also allowed herself as a presenter to be able to feel more connected with them because she's telling them this very personal story. So again, it does require the most courage to be this authentic, but you can also generate the biggest reward. And then lastly, you know, of course you want your story to be relevant to what your presentation is about, but it's also useful because it will give you room to reference your story throughout the presentation. So like, 
even just with Amy, we saw how she continuously brought up how she wanted to become a professional snowboarder. And we knew that off the bat, and we knew that as we walked through her story. And that's what motivated her to keep working towards her goal, which also, as an audience, since she's trying to get that goal, we also, you know, we're pushing for her. We want her to feel that as well. So having this overarching story or theme to constantly refer back to will help you create cohesion with your whole presentation and allow your audience to stay a little bit more engaged. Another example I have is from Sean Anker, who gave a presentation, the story about a unicorn. And so I'm not going to spoil the entire TED Talk, but as he moves through it, he kind of references how he used the same process of convincing his little sister that she was, in fact, a unicorn in order to reframe his thinking at work. So those are just a few of the examples that we can see. And again, just to give you a visual, this is like how my manager had described her public speaking experience. So, you know, she incorporated all of these elements. She has some like cut out visuals for creativity and she's being very authentic by speaking about this really personal story. And then also, I think everyone at one point or another can relate to having a level of uncertainty and nervousness before public speaking. So she definitely nails that relevance part. So those are just the, the main tips, car, creativity, authenticity, and relevance are the main ones that I would say to always keep in mind for your presentations and meetings. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love, can you tell us a little bit more about this, about what you're using with Prezi here to show oh, this yeah. presentation? Yeah, yeah, of course. Really beautifully put together. <laughs> Yeah, I do have to give all credit to my design team because they helped me so much with creating this. But again, you don't need master designers. Um, so what I am using is Prezi Video, which is a virtual presentation software, which, sorry, this is a little bit of a pitch, but it allows you to bring your content onto the screen. So instead of having a screen share, I can just have my content right here. I can point to it. It's a little, little bit of transparency so that you can kind of still see me and just like maintain that connection. So I will have some resources at the end for how you all can try it out yourself. If you have any questions, feel free to email me, but thanks, Marielle. Awesome. Yeah, no, it's beautifully put together. Congrats to your design team. And also, <laughs> I mean, I, I love Prezi. I, I was first introduced to Prezi when it, when you didn't have video, um, when I was teaching here in Argentina and all the teachers would use Prezi for their presentations. And now that you all are doing it with video, I love it. It's, it's really beautifully put together. So um, that was the shameless pitch because I feel like we could all use a little more of this kind of thing with presenting. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. um, so does anyone want to comment or reflect or, you know, add any more um, tips or questions for Nava now based on this, um, this uh, question that she just tackled? If so, feel free to hop off mute. I know we've got folks writing in the chat box saying it looks awesome, it looks fab. Yes, yeah, so great. So, yeah, Cynthia, go ahead and hop off mute. Hi, um, I, I really enjoy kind of that, um, like how you've been providing like specific examples. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it really illuminates like how we're supposed to think through certain elements um, of like how to, how to incorporate elements into our storytelling. I think one question that I have is like a struggle I continually have in kind of having a cohesive story. So I feel like when I'm creating a story or presentation, there's like so many things I want to convey to the audience. Um, so an example might be like back when Amy was talking about her snowboarding experience, like at the very beginning, I think she was very tight about like explaining where she grew up and how she wanted to move to a place with snow. And then that kind of like led to the rest of the story. Um, but do you have tips on like how to just choose the main nuggets um, and how to touch all of the things you want to convey in a very cohesive and not confusing way? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Cynthia, for the great question. Um, so going back to the structure itself, I think that that's a great way to just get started if you know it's a story that you can kind of move through like a sequential flow. But I'm also, another one that I like is the rule of three, which is just like a familiar story structure. And you can kind of just see, like I have it here, even with the three storytelling elements. Um, and I, I didn't do this as well as I should have, but I tried to kind of have like three main points going into this. But I think that that's a great place to start because if you do know that you have a story with a lot of details and you're still trying to figure out like, what should I be including? If you look at okay, what are the like three main points I want to make sure my audience knows and starting with those and then kind of building out because even within those three points, you'll see like, okay, I talked about creativity, but I had examples within it. I had like more details. So you can still have your full story, 
but because you'll have like these main nuggets and like these three main points, your audience will be able to reflect on those big things, but then they'll still remember all the details and how that kind of like all shaped the three main things you were discussing. Thank you. That's really helpful. That's like, like having anchor points. Yes. Yeah. I like that. (laughs) Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Cynthia. Yes. The rule of three is great in storytelling. Um, I, I definitely agree. If, if you're trying to be more humorous as well, um, if anyone, if we have any comedians on the line, I'm sure you've heard of the rule of three, um, just because it adds a nice, uh, it adds a nice cycle to your, to your storytelling and it lets people, um, you know, want more, uh, but also kind of end at a resolution, you know, it's like, okay, uh, three feels good for some reason. I don't know why, maybe yeah. there's some science behind that. <laughs> yeah, there's like some comfort in that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's move on to this next question here. And then actually, before I read the question that was submitted previous, I'm going to read this private question because I think that they can be linked. So I have a private question here um, that reads, when is your story too much? Uh, And then the question that was submitted reads, how to make sure not to overwhelm the audience with too many details in business meetings, but stay, but still lay out the facts. So this kind of also um, hits on what Cynthia just, just asked. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so I am going to, again, talk about the rule of three, because I think that is a great way. And I'm going to take what Cynthia took, said about the anchor points, because I think that by having something that your audience can hold on to, that is really the biggest thing. So you know, that is how you can make sure it's not like what you may think is too much or what may be too many details for the audience. Um, I also think that, you know, when we're talking about business meetings, there can be a lot of, a lot of data and a lot of details that are maybe too in the weeds for most of what you're presenting. And because, you know, you may have been the person involved in the project, a lot of it's important or everything is important, but for what you are presenting, you really only need the main highlights. And so, Again, that's why I think the rule of three is great because you can kind of just be like, okay, these are the three takeaways, but you can still have a story weaved in throughout it because you can say, okay, this is, this is what we started out with during that part where you're laying out everything, like laying out the foundation. You can talk about like, go into a little bit of the nitty gritty, but then you will still have the three main takeaways to get to at the very end. And so I think, yeah, having those anchor points is just the best thing because it will also allow you to see like, okay, what is relevant and what pertains to like point number one, what pertains to point number two. And, you know, if you can like wrap that all up at the end with those three main things, people are going to remember that people are going to be able to have questions about like the specific points, even if it's a detail within it, but maybe they couldn't quite remember what you touched on, but it will just give them something to reference more easily And then it will also just help you as a presenter because you're like, okay, this falls within this point, this falls within this point, and you can just reference it back when needed. And if you ever were just like, okay, give me a quick synopsis, you have those three main points to just go off of. Awesome. Great advice. I love that. So I want to, I want to like dive deeper in on this just because I feel like um, with all of the craziness that has been going on, historically speaking, but recently, especially in the States and lots of other countries as well. But of course, we see a lot of news from the States. I mean, I'm all the, all the way in Argentina and it really affects the world what's happening in the States. Um, and, you know, if, if companies, for example, are really trying to diversify or really trying to, you know, promote inclusion, all these things that we see that we hear actually a lot of people are getting called out for with lip service, let's say, and they're doing... Um, what is it called? Um, Performative activism. You know, how can you share the story that, you know, that is a little uncomfortable for people to hear, but it is someone's reality, let's say about, Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how they have been the the, the only one on a team for, you know, for a long time and they want to try to, you know, make space for others at the table. Like, how do you, how do you put that across in a story in an interview session? And so, I mean, I'm just reflecting and also kind of mm-hmm. adding to my my own reflection. Um, I I think that we need to find the courage to to share that part of ourselves so that we can mm-hmm. help make some some necessary change, uh, especially you know just in in the way that um, we don't need to be the status quo anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't need to show mm-hmm. how we can be put it, fit in a box. You know, this uh, lots of teams right. are also changing the lingo from culture fit to culture add. It's like, okay, how can your story add to our culture instead of asking you to fit into our culture because we have similar stories that we can relate to. Of course, we're, 
we are a lot, um, we are a lot more alike than we are different as we are coming mm -hmm. to find out. But I think that these situations are allowing us to, you know, be more confident in presenting that. Okay, cool. You really want to practice diversity and inclusion. I'm going to share this story. That's gonna, probably going to be a little uncomfortable depending uh, on if you're ready to hear this or not, but this is also the beauty of the story. And this is how I can add to the team because of my experience, you know, and kind of have that arc be a part of the storytelling as well. I'm rambling, but I just wanted yeah, to- Yeah, no, 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 I, I'm like, I'm taking in all your points and I, I like everything that you said. And I definitely think it's like twofold. You know, if we do go back to the interview um, as an example, like as the interviewer, they should be receptive to it. And, you know, that is very indicative of the type of company that they are, but I think we are moving into a society where, yeah, we need to have these uncomfortable conversations because if you're not having them and that's a person's reality, you are just like hiding that entire person's life and just expecting them to be an entirely different person at work. And that's just like, them taking away a part of themselves. And so I don't think that should be an expectation anymore. We should be willing to share these stories. And again, they humanize you and allow you to understand people way more better. So I think it's like part of it, like in an interview setting, they should be making space for this to happen and should be asking questions related to a person's reality. Because yeah, just because we see it in the news all the time, like, and maybe you don't think it personally affects you. You don't know how many other people it's affecting. So I just don't think it's always worth bringing it up as a conversation because you can't really just expect someone to open up unprompted. And, you know, it's definitely okay if they don't want to open up even when prompted, like it's, it's their own prerogative, but I think we need to provide them with that space and allow it, like whether it's in an interview, whether they're already at a company and have been there for years, but like changes definitely need to be made because stories shape who we are as a person. And, you know, kind of going back, like, I know I've shared some, some big stories with like Amy, but it doesn't need to be like a super life altering thing, because as you mentioned, like for a lot of people, this is their daily experiences. And, you know, maybe for people who are listening to the stories, it can seem like, like, well, like I, I never would have thought that people experienced it like that. And to the person who's telling it, they're like, well, this is just my day to day. And so I think we can, we should also think of it like that. Like these are just people's day to day experiences, but they are important for us to know about. And it does reflect who they are. It reflects, you know, who you are as a company too, if you are hiring or not hiring them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Beautifully said. Thank you. I had to dive in there because I feel like it's just a prompt moment. To talk about that. <laughs> no, no, I loved it. <laughs> All right. So speaking of uh, prompt moments, um, if anyone wants to use this moment to hop off mute, please do so. Um, we want to hear from you. So hop off mute if you'd like. I see Cynthia have, doing like this. Have you seen me? Uh, yes. This is Stacia. Hi, Stacia. <laughs> hop off mute. Perfect. We're yes. Ready for I, I will show you my video because I have been just inundated with stuff today and I, I'm not looking my usual red dress best. <laughs> <laughs> so just to tell the audience, I think I need to sit tight now because I spoke um, based on what Nava just said. You know, on this platform, I spoke on my the pain and price of dignity as my corporate journey through IBM. Well, I need to tell you guys that I've gotten so much feedback, both from people who shared the same experience and people who didn't know what I was going through. And since I did that with you, I have took that same speech and took it to the University of the West Indies and did a management perspective on that speech. And then last Wednesday night, I did the same speech. So your, your video has been going out every time I speak. And I did the same speech last week, Wednesday night, and my brother told me I was on fire. <laughs> so yes, I am, I'm now, but I did that speech and it was just hit, 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 everything that happened to me, lots of stuff that's happened to me. And the fact that the book is coming because it was just so much and I've had such positive responses. Great. Great. Stacia, oh. thank you so much for hopping off mute. I want to see if we can find that link to your chat because yeah, I was just yes, about to ask that. <laughs> yes. So I'll, I'll try to simultaneously search for it because it, it is a very touching story. I mean, Stacia, thank you so much for being vulnerable and sharing all of that with us. And I'm so happy that um, you have been able to ride that wave and share it with more folks. So the power of storytelling. I love that you're joining this conversation. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Awesome. All right. Anyone else want to hop off mute? We've got a little over 15 minutes left. So we've got more questions uh, to raise to our guest speaker, but let me know if you want to hop off mute. Stacey, go for it. Um, 
what you share with us, Nabia, is, uh, am I saying your name correctly? Uh, Naba. Naba, okay, sorry. Um, no worries. Is, is, is a treasure. Uh, I recently had a mock interview with someone and I struggled with trying to condense my story and his feedback was that I needed to trim the fat. And I really, at first, I really didn't know how to receive that. Um, but now being uh, on this chat, I've learned now about the rule of three. And I feel more confident in regards to telling my story of over 20 something years of being a professional. So I wanna really thank you, you know, for taking this time out to um, share your, your knowledge and information with us. Well, thank you. I, I'm glad it's been helpful. And yeah, like feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn so we can keep the conversation going. And yeah, I'd love to hear your story as well. If, you know, we can save that for another time though. <laughs> yes, so beautiful. Thank you all for hopping off mute. Okay, so let's roll into this next question and I will have another opportunity for folks to hop off mute a little later. All right, so what should be the voice of the story? First person or third person? What impact does the voice of the story have on the audience? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, let, let me tackle the first question first. Um, I personally like to incorporate stories from the first person because it helps what I think audience connect a little bit more with you as you're sharing the story. Um, to give you an example, one of our, we at Prezi, we have a cohort of virtual presentation innovators and one of them is Alina Valentine and she's a CEO of Skill Scout Film. So she does a lot of video uh, film editing presentations. And so she shared that, you know, our, our brains are just hardwired for stories. And so whenever we hear something, our audience is going to take it in the same way with the same emotions that we experienced it when we were telling it from firsthand. So I really do like that approach. And I also think it's just a little bit easier for me because when I'm sharing a personal story, I can, you know, I, there's a little more passion there and I'm able to uh, talk about it more. But I also, to your point, I want to say, I like incorporating stories from multiple perspectives. And I think it can be super impactful because stories are really just examples and the evidence to elevate your presentation and support it. So even when I was talking about car, um, for each of the different elements, I had a different story and I was sharing them all from a different perspective. And so I think when you are sharing personal stories, like to just use it in first person, but then, you know, for other stories, of course, like incorporate those multiple perspectives. And that also will allow your audience with just more opportunities to relate to what you're sharing. And I think touching on like the impact of it, again, I think it, it does have a strong impact because when the audience can relate to it, then it just, it makes it more easier for them to stay engaged. And, but that's with either first person or third, it's just really, if you can get that connection with them. Beautiful. I love it. I mean, and if I can stretch that into emotional intelligence, philosophizing mm -hmm. a little bit, I would say that the more perspectives actually, the, 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 I don't know if the better, but it, it allows us to create a more holistic vision um, based on different perspectives that are added to the story. So like one of the most touching stories um, for me when I hear um, oh, there's, there are these incredible stories about um, activism and social work that's happening in prisons in the States. Um, and I, I will search the name of the exact um, uh, researcher uh, and, and the, the team that goes in and does these uh, sorts of workshops. Um, and, and it's the story of seeing all these different kinds of people sitting at the table in prison. So you have, um, you know, a white supremacist and also someone from, you know, who's born in the States and someone who may be from a different part of the world. And you see the like the the power and the like anger and and the also the 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 love in on all of these people coming together to just try to be more peaceful in this setting let's say and just try to find you know a way to express themselves through storytelling by them telling their stories so it's like whether you would see this person on the street and like you know decide that you want to hate them it's like you don't you don't know the story and if we could all share in a little bit more of, of open dialogue and storytelling maybe we could you know, heal some of these bonds that have been uh, pretty tattered and torn for, for generations. Um, and that's just my call out to, you know, share stories and practice oh. active listening a little more. Um, as you go into this next question, I'm going to look up um, that info so that you all can okay. take a look yeah, at yeah. stories. <laughs> I want to say it too. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm interested in, in how you respond to this next question though. Um, 
as it relates to weaving in data to, to help have a more compelling narrative. So if this is your question and you're here, let us know. The question reads, how do you smoothly weave data into a compelling narrative? Mm, okay, yeah, th this is a really great question. And I think I, I still struggle with it, but what has helped me a little bit is to, again, start off with just understanding the story I'm trying to tell with the data. So goes back again to the rule of three or the hero's journey. And I kind of have to first pull out what are the main takeaways that I want my coworkers or colleagues to have when I'm sharing all this data with them, or even, you know, if it is like a sales pitch or customer demo. And so rather than just focusing on like all the raw data and all the numbers, I, I should think about like, how am I going to storyboard my arguments? What do I want to convey to the, the to everyone who's listening and what do I want them to take away from that? So first I, I start off with those like three main things, try to break it down into them. And then from there I can fill in, you know, the charts, the actual raw numbers and just like add all the details to it. Um, another way to like think about this specifically with the hero's journey is to just like start off, you know, with the introduction and the key message, like first set, set the scene. So like, was there like a survey you conducted? Was there a study? Is it like how many emails you sent out? Try to use that number first. It's like, okay, this is this is the, our basis. This is who we started out with. And then again, like use your three main points to kind of like fill in, okay, this is the data that supports this. And then finally, you can end with like the high level insights that you got from those three nuts, those three main points. And throughout it, you will just be able to like weave in the data, but it won't just feel like you're throwing a ton of data on them. Rather, it will feel like you're sharing this story and you have all these points and maybe you've added charts, maybe you have added graphs, but you're talking them through it and highlighting the main parts. So they're not just seeing like a big Excel spreadsheet or even just like a ton of numbers on an image. And I find those to be super compelling because, I mean, we work with a lot of, uh, let's say, just data, whether we know it or not, actively or not, you know, whether we're just kind of on Instagram doing our thing or on different social media is doing our thing, or if we're like on the, on the team that creates content and looking at data and all these things. Um, I find that when you're listening to an authentic story and they're throwing the data in and it's not just about, you know, making money or getting the high numbers and you can see, okay, wow, um, this data is so compelling that it makes me think about the situation differently. Uh, we just had a summit uh, at Power to Fly a couple of weeks ago, lifting Latin voices all over the world. And one of our keynote speakers, I mean, she rocked it. I definitely uh, recommend watching the whole summit, um, uh, but she rocked it because she was showing just the, 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 the buying power um, of the, the Latinx community in the States and how we need to be more mindful of, you know, how we're treating people because, you know, we, we have power um, as far as where we put our dollar. And when you can show that number um, as it relates to something that's, you know, is happening on a social level, mm -hmm. um, it just makes you rethink on how we can just be, be better <laughs> and not, right. um, and be more mindful about that as well. So I love that when data is so compelling that it, that it makes you rethink about social st structures. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like how you tie that in because, you know, what you shared specifically, you can have like one very compelling data point and you can use that to kind of craft your entire presentation. And so you can still have the three like takeaways, but you can constantly, again, with relevance, refer back to it and show like why this is so compelling and why we need to be talking about it and why it's so important. Absolutely. And actually, I'm going to hold for a light pause to see if someone wants to join uh, in on this reflection or ask a question because we've got about 10 minutes left. So if anyone wants to hop off uh, mute, now's your time to shine. If not, I've got more questions here. All right, I'm going to roll into some more questions. Um, so let's see, let's, let's try to go over at least one more question. And then uh, Nava, I'll ask you to just leave us with some food for thought, or maybe touch on anything that you didn't get a chance to touch on in this past uh, 50 minutes. So let's see, let's jump to uh, what phrases or attitudes should we avoid during a presentation? Mm -hmm. What are common mistakes? Uh, what are some common mistakes that are easy to fix uh, as regards to this? Okay, nice question. So, um, the first thing I want to start with is I think a lot of people will tell you like 
avoid saying um or yeah during a presentation because it can make you like come off as unprofessional. But I actually was reading something and I couldn't find the exact link, so I'll have to go back. But that Obama speechwriter actually went back and added in like ums, yeahs, and likes because without it, he just kind of came across as a little bit robotic and it made him a little bit disingenuous. So I think that that's instead of avoiding that, I think you should actually like have a little bit of those. And, you know, for me, those come naturally, so I don't need to worry about it. But, you know, having just a couple ums will will make you still see like, OK, you're human. You're just talking to us. And also when you're telling a story, you know, there, there will be some times where you'll you'll have pauses like that. So that's one thing that you should include rather than avoid. Um, and then also, depending on the story you're presenting, I would recommend uh in terms of smiling, like you should just try to do that as much as you can during the presentation. And of course, you know, if you're talking about something really serious and smiling is not the thing, or like if it's sad, you might not need that. But um, for me, it really helps because when I'm smiling, I just feel a little happier and it just helps me like loosen up a little bit and lose some of the nerves. So what I like to do is like in my presenter notes itself, I will include like pauses to breathe and smile or what um, I've heard before is to put like pictures around your computer of things that make you smile, like your pets, your family, um, you know, anything you really like. And that that really helps a lot. Um, another thing that I'm going to dive into, and again, I'm going to pull up my Prezi here, is common mistakes that I've heard from uh, Nick Morgan, who's actually a Harvard lecturer and author. And so I'm going to pull them up right here. And so he has five mistakes that he says, which are the lack of interest, too much information, not being deep enough, hiding your values, and losing sight of the most important things. And so going into each of these, I'll try to do them a little quickly because I know we're, we're getting short on time. Um, but for the first one, he says that speakers will try to have like some sort of shock value. And so, you know, we, we do this because we want our audience to stay engaged and just like want to know what's going to happen next. But this can actually have an adverse effect because it can end up just like confusing your audience because there's so much for them to follow. So it really is just about you should try to like signal where you're headed in a presentation. So that kind of helps with having the rule of three and the structure in the hero's journey because your audience is familiar with that and they'll know where to move forward. The next one is um, I mentioned earlier about being authentic. So sometimes we can end up oversharing when we're attempting to do so. And so what Nick recommends is to ask yourself, like, what information is absolutely necessary to include? And that kind of ties back again to like the data and rule of three. You, you really don't want to give them too much. And like for you as a presenter, you're probably like, well, everything is important to include. But we kind of have to take a step back, get out of our head and just be like, OK, what are what are the main things that we really want to be sharing with this? The next one is we're not being deep enough. So um, we really want to provide context that intrigues people so that they come back to it. And so Nick shares the storytelling paradox, which tells us that if you know we write and deliver great stories, people aren't going to be able to get enough of that. And with that comes a lot of like bingeable content. So Netflix is a great example. We have Game of Thrones, House of Cards, you know, even more recent example, there's only one season, but everyone's obsessed with Squid Game. And so like with that, we really were, we can't wait for the next season. And then when it does come, we just automatically binge it. So the lesson to take away from this is that we want our audience to feel the emotions of the characters and we want them to understand where we're coming from. So if we're the character of a project's character, we want the audience to feel that as well. Moving into the fourth one, and these kind of tie in together, but we don't want to only highlight the achievements and the great parts. So like with Amy, she talked about, you know, all the challenges and the struggles and like, yeah, we knew it was going to end well for her, but we were able to feel exactly what she went through by sharing all the different events. And then lastly, this also ties into that, but we don't want to lose sight of the most important things. And so this means that we want to see the best and the worst of our characters through their ups and their downs. So you need to show all the moments. You can't just show the best parts of it, show like, okay, even when it comes to a project, like these were all the results. You do want to say like, Maybe, you know, you had some bumps in the road. You want to share how that happened and why that happened so that you can learn for next time and like improve going forward. So, yeah, those were just like I know a lot of different um, mistakes to keep in keep in mind. But I just I really like to think of those 
as I'm crafting my presentation, because it helps if I'm getting too in the weeds to be like, okay, yes, I want to, I want to show like their struggles, but I don't want to have too much information either. So it really is a balance, but always good to keep these five in mind. And I feel like there's a, there's probably like a networking factor that happens there where you can say, if you want to know more about this, you know, we can chat mm-hmm. after this conversation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but for now, for the sake of, you know, keeping the storytelling concise, I'm going to move on, you know? Um, so we've got about three minutes left. I would love to just ask you to touch on anything uh, that you'd like to leave us with um, and then remind us how we can connect with you when we finish this conversation. Yeah. Um, so I did mention this a little bit when I talked about car, but I think one of the biggest things to incorporate into any of your presentations is just like some sort of visual element. Like, again, it doesn't need to be anything like really big or well-designed, but it will have a big impact because most of us are visual learners. So if we can at least see a little bit while you're presenting and you don't have to be a tiny like person in the corner, again, another plug for Prezi, but you know, it's great to just have that, that visual element. Um, and then, yeah, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. It's just Naba Ahmed and yeah, thank you all so much for letting me join you. And if you have any other questions or even any other tips that I didn't include, please feel free to share them with me. Awesome. I love that. And I think I'm just going to, since we've got about two minutes left, um, we've got a great reflection uh, in the chat box that I'll just read to close this session out. So thank you, Christina, for dropping this in the chat box. It reads, uh, thanks so much to you both. As a researcher, it's been a journey to moving away from technical reports to making sure we're telling stories to make the findings more relatable and impactful. It stresses the importance of that information in a way that it draws attention to a more general audience. In the past, so much important research felt like it was being gatekept by a specific field with specific terminology and complicated language. I'm still learning, but I think it's so important to make a bigger impact with your lessons learned. So thank you for this session. It's been incredibly useful. Thank you so much for dropping that in the chat box, Christina. And wow, thank you everyone for joining the session. I told you all that time would fly. Um, I hope that you all connect with our guest speaker after this conversation. Uh, and remember, you know, your story is important. So don't be afraid to share it. Check out Prezi because I'm always like just enamored with the way that they do their beautiful presentations. Shameless plug. Um, I, <laughs> I want to use Prezi more to just be quite honest. And I hope that you all were able to enjoy uh, today's presentation. So we'll see you on the next chat. Thank you so much. And I also, I see a couple of familiar faces. Hi, Monse. Hi, Nick. Thank you for joining. <laughs> Yay.